And then again, we'll turn. There we go. So we're turning this recording part off when we go to Q&A. So there's, there's St. John uh, County Courthouse 20 years ago. So this, uh, this, is a, um, this is a true crime talk. And some of you might be familiar with the story. Uh, I'll keep this first one. This true crime story from 1857 involved two Irish Catholic men and a, and a youth who, who targeted, robbed, and murdered an entire family, including four young children, in a quiet area of rural uh, uh, Simon's uh, Parish, St. John County. Uh, the murders of the McKenzie family, the, the, the murders of the McKenzie family was not a typical crime, but it reveals a number of important themes for helping to understand pre-Confederation New Brunswick society, such as the way the justice system worked, uh, mid-Victorian theories of criminality, uh, the role of the Roman Catholic Church in the St. John area, and also the role of the press in sort of uh, inventing murder uh, as a cultural phenomenon. Uh, this is a really interesting case, aside from its sheer violence, and that the, 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 the culprits or the, the assailants were Roman Catholic and the victims were Protestant. Yet, despite this taking place uh, in an era of, of heightened uh, religious antagonism and sectarianism, the crime did not appear to involve any major public manifestation of, uh, in terms of the courtroom and in the press of any sort of ethnic or religious prejudice. Uh, again, I found that really interesting. If you, if you know the history of New Brunswick at this time, uh, this really stands out, uh, that, that aspect alone. Okay, so uh, the, uh, the, the attack took place uh, near uh, Beaver Lake uh, in 18, uh, in, on a Protestant middle-class family in a, in a parish that was largely uh, Protestant. Now this, if you notice this map from the, uh, the famous 1877 census of St. John, it's called Bear Lake. So someone got that one wrong, but it's actually Beaver Lake. And I've kind of put a yellow uh, mark there to show the general area. But this, again, this is 20 years later, right? This is a map 20 years later. Uh, 20 years after the crime, but you can see, uh, you can see the, uh, of course, Miss Peck there, and you can see Loch Loman. Uh, Loch Loman's an important uh, geographic uh, marker for us uh, for tonight. So Robert McKenzie was a Scottish immigrant who had worked as a master tailor in St. John for a number of years, and he had operated in a building in uptown St. John that had been owned by Benedict Arnold. Uh, in the early 1850s, he operated a chair factory in Lower Miss Peck. Now, looking at Simon's Parish, I couldn't find any earlier census data, but by 1871, which again is a bit after our crime, Simon's had about 3,500 people, including uh, over 100 Black residents, and it was a very Irish place. Almost 70% of the population claimed to be Irish in terms of their ethnicity, uh, so it, in a way it was more Irish than St. John County itself. Uh, about 38% of the population in 1871 was Roman Catholic, the rest was Protestant, including uh, Church of England, Wesleyan, Presbyterian, and Baptist. And by the way, can you hear me? Is the audio okay? If someone wants to turn their mic on and let me know, is the audio okay? It's great. Okay, thank you. Uh, so St. John, uh, around 1860, after an unsuccessful venture in sawmilling, Mackenzie located to rural Simons Parish about 10 miles, quote, up the Black River Road. Mackenzie was a lender of money and he was rumored to keep a significant sum of cash on his property. He and his wife, who was a, a, a Reed from, from Carlton or West St. John, Effie Reed, had four children under the age of six. So again, this, the fact that this entire family was wiped out uh, was, was unprecedented, at least at, at this time in, in the history of New Brunswick. At the time of the attack on the residents, the Mackenzies employed no domestic servants, and Mackenzie was losing the service of a high, uh, services of a hired uh, farmhand, a situation that ultimately led to tragedy. Uh, an account from the 1890s of the crime described the residents of the area as, quote, ignorant, simple-minded folk, and suge suggested that public knowledge of Mackenzie's wealth and, quote, his pride in displaying his riches had contributed to his death. So uh, let's look at the sectarian angle, because I mentioned, I mentioned the, the Catholic Protestant thing. So in the 1840s, increasing numbers of newcomers from Ireland joined uh, Catholic Irish the Irish Catholic community in St. John and neighboring Portland, which is now the north end of St. John, was a separate municipality until the late 1800s. Uh, uh, centers that already had sizable Protestant populations, including Protestant Irish populations. The potato, potato famine, which, which broke out in 1846, brought a larger proportion of poor, less skilled native Irish to British North America, including New Brunswick. This influx resulted in new recruits to the Anti-Catholic Loyal Orange Association, the LOA, sometimes called the Orange Lodge, uh, 
uh, uh, who included native born Protestants, in addition to small scale acts of intimidation and violence involving Orange men and Catholic immigrants in the St. John area. And there are also riots in Fredericton and Woodstock, New Brunswick in the 1840s. There were, there were major riots uh, in, on March 17th, St. Patrick's Day, 1845, and July 12th, 1847, and 1849 in, in, in St. John. Of course, July 12th was the, the, the day of, uh, to commemorate the uh, King William of Orange, the, the patron uh, of, of the Orange Lodge, uh, and the Battle of the Boyne in Ireland. The York Point riot in St. John in 1849 resulted in up to a dozen deaths expose the weaknesses of, uh, of the justice system, and also according to academic historians, the anti-Catholic biases of that justice system, and ended up increasing support for the Loyal Orange Association, not just in St. John, but in the entire province, at least in the English speaking areas. And the analysis of Scott C., an American historian who's done a lot of work on uh, social violence in uh, New Brunswick, uh, the, uh, uh, the Loyal Orange Association acted as a type of nativist vig vigilante force that was uh, supported by the colony's Protestant majority. Under pressure from the Lieutenant Governor for greater impartiality, the St. John Grand Jury in 1849 indicted after the riot, the York Point riot, 20 Orangemen, but only five went to trial and none of them were convicted of any offense. In contrast, two dozen Catholics were indicted, 11 went to trial and two were convicted. So the point I'm making here is that there was a real uh, legacy and, and, and a past uh, a pattern of uh, ethnic uh, and religious animosity uh, in, in St. John and area, you know, prior, prior to the 1850s. Okay, uh, Patrick Slavin, uh, I didn't, I don't, there's no pictures of, of, of uh, Patrick Slavin or Hugh Breen uh, or Patrick Slavin Jr. who were the three uh, accused in, in the crime, right? Uh, so uh, the uh, uh, Patrick Slavin was a Catholic uh, in his 50s or 60s. He had worked constructing the European and North American Railway which ran from St. John to Shediac. He lived with his 47-year-old wife, Bridget, and three children in Upper Loch Lomond. So remember Lake Loch Lomond uh, Lake? Uh, uh, the eldest son, Pat, elder son, Patrick, or Patrick Jr., had immigrated with his parents from Ireland in the 1840s. Two other sons, uh, brothers John and James, had been born in Simon's Parish. They were younger. Uh, Slavin, Slavin had a friend called Hugh Breen, who was an Oromocto born laborer. He was not an immigrant, but he was Irish Catholic who had worked uh, in Fredericton at a hotel. He, is, he had worked as a, a so-called scow man or on, on the boats uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, around St. John Harbor. And uh, he had a wife who he had deserted. He also had worked as a laborer with Slavin. He had posed as a hired hand uh, ready to start working at the Mackenzie farm. So that's how, that's how they got their in to the Mackenzie farm. Uh, Breen sort of scattered out uh, the farm and, and met Mr. and Mrs. McKenzie and said that he was going to bring his wife to work there as a, as a couple of, of servants uh, for the McKenzies. On October 25th, 1857, a neighbor discovered uh, the McKenzie homestead, that the McKenzie homestead had been destroyed by fire, directed by a local justice of the peace named William Hawk. And these justices of the peace were like part-time officials, right? So that's how the investigation began. Uh, volunteer searchers who were neighbors uncovered, searched the ruins and uncovered the partial remains of, of Mr. McKenzie in the debris of a small residence. There were two buildings. There was like a hired hands uh, house and then there was the uh, then there was the main farmhouse. Right. And uh, so uh, McKenzie was found. His body was found in their small residence and the, the body of his wife and one child were found in the debris of the larger uh, residence, which had been burnt down. There was an open. If I could ask people to, I'm just talking, if I could ask people to turn their mics off because we re we're recording this, thanks. Uh, the, uh, so an open empty safe was found nearby. There were papers strewn around. So obviously signs of a robbery as well as uh, murder was presumed. I don't know how to make it, so you Okay. Um, just asking people to turn their mics off. It's hard for me to control all the controls here when I'm speaking. Um, so, uh, so Captain George Scholar of St. John Police, the St. John Police were called into the area, although this is not really their jurisdiction, but this happened in many times. I turn the time. device off. <clears throat> okay. I don't know. Getting some chatter here, if people could uh, mute, mute their mics, please. Uh, so Captain George Scholar of St. John, Scholar of St. John Police, uh, was called out and after talking to neighbors of the victims, they suspected Slavin and Breen immediately. I was impressed by how quickly they became the top suspects. 
but they could not be found, which was even more suspicious, right? In the meantime, the St. John County coroner, Dr. Uh, Bayard, Dr. William Bayard, uh, visited the crime scene and prepared to convene an inquest at the St. John County Courthouse. So this is a, a, a picture of a, a photo of Bayard on the, on the left, but on the right, it's just, it's a, it's a scene from a, a British or an Irish uh, depiction of a typical coroner's jury. Uh, and as you might see, it's all men, right? Because women were not on any jury in New Brunswick until the 1950s. Of course, the, the role of the jury was determined who were the victims and how had they been killed, and if possible, who was responsible uh, if it was a wrongful death. Uh, the coroner's inquest, in terms of detail, went beyond the usual parameters of an inquest and took on many attributes of a preliminary, preliminary inquiry before a police magistrate. It was very detailed, and the coroner also asked the media not to publish a lot of the details, and for the most part, they did. I, I was impressed by that, because the idea being is that if the details from the coroner's inquest were published, public, published and made known, it would be difficult for someone to get a fair trial uh, before a jury. I, I was kind of impressed that this was, you know, they were thinking about that way back in 1857. So the coroner's jury heard testimony from Bridget, Slavin's wife, who denied any knowledge of the crime, but claimed that a man named Green or Breen had stayed with her family for two weeks, but he had recently, recently departed for Boston or, or, or Woodstock. Uh, the most important witness at the inquest was her 12-year-old son, John, who despite his, his mother's outburst warning not to incriminate his father, testified that on the night of the murders, his father, brother Pat, and Breen had left the family home on some sort of errand and then later returned with money, clothing, a watch, a purse, and other items. Uh, they then all had departed to hide in the woods. So on the evening of October 29th, uh, in Loch Lomond, Captain Schooler arrested Bernard Haggerty, Slavin's nephew, and his father, Slavin's brother-in-law, as suspected accessories to murder. I just want to note, this is a slide in Victorian uh, true crime, and the Victorians were fascinated by it. It's really interesting. I'll see how many like, podcasts and, you know, movies and Netflix shows are dealing with uh, Victorian uh, not just now, it's been happening for a few years, you know, uh, Victorian uh, true crime, but the Victorians themselves were fascinated by true crime. Uh, they were, especially tales of violent murder, police investigations, dramatic trials and executions, both, uh, both fiction and, and newspaper, magazine, pamphlet and books accounts of actual cases found, uh, you know, a ready audience. And again, this is a time of uh, mass circulation newspapers, increased literacy, and also stories can be, you know, the latest news on a case could be transmitted uh, by the telegraph. So the Beaver Lake incident attracted a wide audience. I, I know it received some attention in Toronto. I have to try to check other newspapers in other parts of Canada to see how it was reported. Uh, getting back to the inquest, the next day at the inquest, the Haggerty's, who were kind of compelled to testify, revealed that the suspects had been hiding in a camp near their home in Upper Loch Lomond, but they had declared their innocence not saying they were not involved in the attack on the Mackenzies, but fearing that they would be blamed for the murders anyway, they, they supposedly planned to flee the province uh, by, by going in the direction of the Bend, which was the, the old name for Moncton. But this time, by the way, the government of New Brunswick had posted a reward for the, uh, the apprehension of, uh, of anyone involved in, in the murder. Following this testimony to the, to the inquest, the coroner's jury returned a verdict of willful murder against the three fugitives, uh, Pat Slavin Sr. and Jr., as well as Hugh Breen. Later that day, Captain Schooler, uh, two police officers, High Constable uh, George Stockford, uh, who was a county constable, and volunteers, including residents of the area, uh, tracked down the fugitives in a swampy forest several miles from the Slavin cabin. Uh, they were in bad shape. They were cold. They, you know, they were hungry. Uh, the, uh, the pursuers have been guided by one of the Haggerty's somewhat reluctantly and again assisted by local relatives. Uh, the, two, the two adults did not try to flee. Young Pat did try to flee until uh, one of the officers threatened to shoot him. He stopped. Uh, so I just want to make a comment here on the, uh, you know, as an historian, you're always looking at, at in, in the newspapers of when you're looking at your particular event, what else is going on. I was struck by two things here. The, same, the crime in St. John was very violent. I mean, you know, and the details were published, very horrible details. Uh, cold-bloodedly, you know, Slavin gave very cold-blooded testimony about how he killed uh, small children. Um, so the details of this violent crime, the cold-blooded murder of a mother and her four children in their home with an axe, right? 
uh, it was quite shocking. It violated all the norms of Victorian domestic life. You know, the home and hearth was supposed to was supposed to be a a protected special place. Yet the Victorians, if you read the newspapers of the day, the Victorians were no strangers to death, and the press contained many accounts of violence, graphic violence. So some, you know, the Victorians, uh, they might have censored out some of the. Uh, sexual aspects of things, uh, kind of uh, prudery, but I, I, was, I was really shocked by the, the level of violence being reported on. Of course, 1857 was a particularly uh, violent year because of things like the Indian uh, rebellion or uprising against British rule, right, uh, by, by the Indian, by the uh, Sepoy army in India. This is a violent uprising which involved the killing of British soldiers and civilians, as well as women and children, right, by, by, the, by the rebels. And of course, the British put it down in a very ruthless way, uh, right? It was almost like a war of extermination, right? It was very bloody. And of course, the reporting on the Indian mutiny or rebellion was, was, was coming in every few days in the middle of the trial. And I was really struck by, you know, the contrast, but also the fact that there's lots of violence in the media. Okay, following the verdict, the coroner ordered the three prisoners to be sent to trial. This was an interesting tidbit of legal history. A coroner could commit people to trial back then. Uh, so this was confirmed by the grand jury, so there was not going to be a preliminary inquiry. It was going right to a jury trial. Now, the trial was supervised by Judge Robert Parker. I could not find a, a picture of him uh, uh, without traveling, but I'm sure I could. He, Parker was a, the son of a prominent New York loyalist and a former law student of Ward Chipman Jr. Uh, Parker had served time as a member of the Legislative Assembly in the 1820s. And prior to being appointed a justice of the Supreme Court in 1834, he'd actually served as the colony's solicitor general. So what's really interesting about the trial is the prosecutors were the solicitor general and the attorney general of the liberal government of New Brunswick at the time, right? And uh, this practice continued into the early 1900s. And I really don't know when it stopped, but I'm sure someone does. So well into the 20th century, murder cases in New Brunswick and other provinces were prosecuted by the attorney general and or the solicitor general of the government if they were lawyers and they were members of the cabinet. In some cases, you know, uh, premier. So this is actually Charles Fisher, the liberal politician, is actually also the premier of the province and he's prosecuting a murder trial in St. John County. Uh, so the uh, so Fisher was a York County barrister and reform politician. If you read up on the political history of New Brunswick, he was leader of the so-called liberal smashers that was their nickname, a government elected in 1854. The Smashers were active in passing new laws, such as the Controversial Prohibition Act of 1885, which led to the temporary downfall of the Liberals, was soon appeared, but the Liberals came back soon after. Assisting was the Attorney General, Charles Waters, with, with two Ts. I don't have a picture for Waters, but was notable about Waters. He was an Irish uh, Catholic lawyer from St. John, but he represented a riding in Victoria County. Uh, he was supposedly the first Catholic to sit on the cabinet or the executive council in the province of New Brunswick. He would later be appointed a county court judge and a court of vice admiralty. So the, these are some political and legal heavy hitters. And it's interesting that the Catholic defendants in this case were being uh, one of the prosecutors was a Catholic um, lawyer. And I don't, I don't think that's a coincidence, but of course, he also happened to be uh, attorney general. Okay. Uh, so this is actually a drawing from uh, one of the two pamphlets that was uh, that was uh, created uh, as a result of the trial. This is the one you can find online, uh, the, the Beaver Lake, uh, the Beaver Lake tragedy. Uh, it was published in uh, New York, and it was based on reporting by the uh, the Morning Freeman, the St. John uh, newspaper. There was another pamphlet that was produced as well. I have not been have not been able to find a copy. There are other newspapers as well that I consulted for this the, for this paper. Uh, other newspapers in St. John and beyond who reported in detail on the case. So who was in the defense? Well, the defense was assigned by the trial judge. There was no legal aid in 1857. These were not wealthy people. So the defense was assigned by the trial judge, David S. Kerr, who was a very able and seasoned barrister. Kerr objected to reports that he had been hired by the defendants, and uh, he later faced hard feelings and supposedly even threats from the community for his involvement in the defense. Uh, he was assisted, assisted by A. R. Wetmore, a St. John lawyer, who later would be an anti-Confederation member of the assembly, before converting to the cause of confederation. And I believe Wetmore uh, later uh, 
uh, was, you know, stayed involved with the provincial government after 1867. And he was, I think he was one of the prosecutors in the Maggie Vale case, uh, you know, pro prosecutor of John Monroe, who was accused of murdering uh, his, uh, his, his mistress or girlfriend, Maggie Vale, and her young daughter, another East St. John tragedy in the late 1860s, early 70s. So here's, uh, yeah, so here's the, uh, Here's the uh, front page of the uh, the Beaver Lake tragedy. So again, if you want more detail, you, you can read, read, you can find this online, right? It's an interesting read. And here's a page, and again, uh, part of a page, uh, this is talking about Slavin uh, pleading guilty. Um, so the press covered the trial closely and at least two pamphlets were published. Again, this one can be found online. It was based on the St. John Freeman's reporting. The St. John Freeman, as many people may know, was a newspaper published by Timothy Warren Anglin who later became a politician, uh, and it represented Irish Catholic issues in St. John and beyond. Uh, uh, the other pamphlet uh, does not seem to, to be extant, but it was based on reporting for a newspaper called the St. John Leader, and the reporter was George W. Day, who I think was a pretty prominent journalist in his day. Uh, so what happens with the case? Well, uh, even if uh, all attacks have been, even if the attack, if, uh, Slavin admitted to being the only person carrying out the, the actual murders, but even if uh, he was the only person to pick up an ax and strike the deadly blows, under English Dash New Brunswick law, all three, all three of the accused were potentially guilty of murder. Uh, now, there was only uh, one trial for one person. Why? Because when Slavin Sr. And, and Breen were asked to enter their plea when they were arraigned, they responded uh, guilty, meaning uh, that uh, they, they would avoid a trial and it'd be, they would be automatically sentenced to death. And that was the law for murder in Canada until 1961. There were no degrees of murder. Now you could take a chance and go to trial and maybe there's a slight chance you might be acquitted. There, in some cases, there's a chance that a jury might, 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 might come down with manslaughter, but there were no degrees of murder until 1961. So, uh, the, uh, in theory, uh, the only hope they had was if the provincial uh, cabinet uh, could uh, order the death sentence commuted to a life in prison. In this case, it would be the, uh, uh, the old, well, the New Brunswick Penitentiary in Simons Parish. We, we had a provincial penitentiary back then. Now, I haven't really looked at this in a lot of detail, but the, the prob one of the pro possible problems here is that the Attorney General and Solicitor General, are, who are leaders in that cabinet of the the New Brunswick government are prosecuting the, the accused. So I'm not sure how they could turn around. Maybe they have to, re, they would have to excuse themselves from that, from that. Uh, anyway, the prospect was extremely unlikely of any sort of uh, uh, commutation uh, of, of the uh, death sentence, uh, given the circumstances of the case. It was just so over the top. There's a lot of community outrage, uh, when, particularly when children are killed. Uh, although there are a few press accounts about the, the fact that the accused didn't have religious training and that they were poor and ignorant and things like that. Uh, but there was no public discussion of mercy, and I don't think any mercy was expected. Uh, so, uh, so sentences were not passed right away. Again, it's another shot of the courthouse, and you, you notice the, uh, that model car is not from 1957. But anyway, the jail, as some people may know, the old uh, county jail, which was taken down in the 70s, I think, after a fire, used to be uh, sort of uh, facing this side uh, of the uh, of the courthouse, right? Uh, and that's where the uh, prisoners would have been held and where any uh, executions took place as well at this time. So sentences were not passed right away. There was still a trial to be scheduled, and that was a trial of young Pat Slavin, uh, who pleaded not guilty to murder, probably under the advice of uh, David S. Kerr. Uh, so this trial led to an unusual situation. Hugh Breen, a self-confessed murderer, would act as a witness for the prosecution, and Patrick Slavin Sr., who had confessed to being, you know, carried out all the violence uh, at the McKenzie farm, would testify for the defense. So uh, very interesting, right, that, 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 that these, uh, these people who were so heavily involved in, in the crime are now testifying. Uh, one for the Crown, one for the defense. Now, in his testimony, Breen did not link young Pat to any of the violence, but he testified that he had stood watch. He'd acted as a, uh, you know, a stood guard sort of thing, uh, a lookout, that he had retrieved a strong box key from Mr. McKenzie after he had been killed in the, uh, in the smaller uh, house, and that he had helped search uh, the main farmhouse for loot after, the, after Mrs. McKenzie and the four children had been uh, 
had been had been killed, right? Um, if this was the case, then you know he it fits the uh, you know he 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 he's just as guilty of murder under the under the law at the time, right? What the defense stressed uh, and 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 Slavin Senior in his testimony tried to shield his son from this type of guilt or culpability. Uh, the defense was that Pat was young. He was supposedly simple-minded. He didn't have any uh, schooling or religious instruction. I mean, the, the Slavins were Catholic, uh, but there's not a lot of evidence they attended church, uh, you know, and, and that type of thing. After, well, first of all, they lived, you know, 12 miles out in the country and, and probably didn't even own a horse. Uh, so uh, his also, uh, Pat didn't seem to have any prior knowledge of the crime. Another argument is that he feared his brutal father, like he would go along with what his father said, right? Slavin's testimony underplayed his son's involvement and tended to put more blame on, on Breen. And it's really hard to put any more blame on Slavin, blame on Slavin because the, the words out of his own mouth were, were fairly blameworthy, right? Okay, so here's, a, here's another illustration from uh, the, uh, here's another illustration from, illustration from that pamphlet. So it's trying to show, uh, again, this is, the illustration was made in New York, you know, based on reading the transcript. So, you know, it, it shows, uh, 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 the details aren't quite correct, but it shows uh, Slavin uh, hitting, uh, about to strike uh, Robert McKenzie with some sort of uh, planning tool or something like that. He was, he was hit from behind with an ax. Uh, it shows like a chair factory, right? So there was no longer a chair factory in operation. This was simply the higher hands uh, uh, house, right, uh, uh, where the attack took place. Anyway, there were kind of there's kind of three interesting legal issues. One was Pat's age. He was about 16. Now, if he had been a bit younger, if he had been under 14, for example, the Crown prosecutors would have to convince the judge that the trial should even go ahead because uh, the onus, uh, when there was a serious crime committed by someone uh, under under the age of 14, I believe it was. Um, uh, there was a, a presumption that they could not be held fully accountable, right? So uh, uh, obviously that that didn't matter in this case because because Pat was over 16. The other thing is that Pat was not protected if he if he was found guilty, he was not protected from execution in terms of what the law said. Uh, as late as 1910, and I've had students do a paper on this case in Ontario. Um, can, can Canada hanged a 17 year old boy, an English immigrant, uh, uh, for murder. Uh, and he was only 17. Uh, and uh, I think it was Belleville, Ontario, someplace like that. Anyway, the reality was that youth under 18 were rarely hanged in Canada. Despite this, to do so was fully legal until uh, Diefenbaker, uh, D uh, John Diefenbaker's Criminal Code Amendments of 1961, which made it illegal to hang anyone under 18. Uh, the prosecutor, uh, one of the two prosecutors who claimed that he had been an opponent of capital punishment before taking on this case, but now had changed his mind, told the jury not to think about what would happen to 16-year-old Pat Slavin if they found him guilty. Um, the third point that's of interest is, uh, which would know, be interesting to see what a modern uh, judge and jury would do with this, is the admissibility of Pat's statement or confession to Captain Schoolar the night uh, he was taken in. It's not totally clear that he was properly warned that anything he would say could be taken down and used against him. But uh, the judge admitted that statement, and, and it was uh, uh, obviously an important uh, part of part of the trial. Okay, uh, so I got a kick out of this too because there wasn't much there wasn't much discussion of of, of uh, the 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 shape or the look of the faces and skulls and that type, the demeanor you know of of the accused in the 1850s, but in a later account written in the 1890s, uh, there was so. Uh, and this is a slide about forensic phrenology, this sort of Victorian belief, and it extended into the early 20th century as well, that you could sort of study the shape and the look of people's heads, you know, uh, their skulls, and it could determine their you know their their their, their demeanor, their, their their criminality, their intelligence, you know, it, it was pseudoscience, but it was taken seriously in some uh, some quarters and, and was called phrenology. Uh, so although the public by the 1850s was definitely interested in, in these pseudoscientific trends like phrenology and the notion of a born criminal class, St. John reporters avoided attempts to link Slavin's appearance to his character. I, I don't find much reporting, you know, of, of, of negative physical descriptions in the media of Slavin Sr., but an account written in the 1890s was heavily influenced, well, was, was influenced by late Victorian theories of a criminal class and this idea of degeneration. 
uh, the physical look of degeneration. Slavin's low brow and overhanging forehead supposedly, quote, gave him a sinister look. And although his, quote, clear blue, clear blue eye, eyes and well-shaped nose, end of quote, created a less threatening appearance, quote, the lower part of his face was of the brutal animal look. So again, this was written by uh, uh, Kilby Reynolds in, in the mid-1890s, you know, decades after uh, decades after the, um, the actual crime, right? So uh, again, we'd like to know why did, how did Reynolds have a description? <laughs> I mean, he did talk to some people uh, who remembered the case from the 1850s, uh, but still, uh, we haven't found any photographs of, uh, of Slavin or, or Bream. Okay, uh, so again, we have to go back to, the, back to the area. And again, as I mentioned before, this map, although it gives us a nice uh, a visual of the area, you can see Lattimore Lake there and, and you know, Redhead and uh, Lower Mississippi Point. This is from 1876, 77, right? So it's 20 years after. And again, it also shows, uh, it gives, for some reason, it calls Beaver Lake, Bear Lake. Uh, so Judge Parker, in his charge to the jury, he's, he, he sums up the case for the jury prior to the verdict. He was overcome by emotion. And despite testimony along these lines from Breen and, and Slavin, he dismissed the coercion defense offered by CARE and explained to the jury that its main challenge would be deciding whether or not Patrick Jr. had the ability to distinguish from right or wrong, right? And if he did, then he was not legally insane. Uh, and if he, if, but if he was not able to distinguish from right or wrong, uh, he could be deemed legally insane and he would not uh, be convicted of murder, but he would be sent to the lunatic asylum probably for the rest of his life, right? Interestingly, David Kerr, when addressing the jury for the defense, recalled the alleged injustice of a past sentence, the execution of Patrick Bergen, the so-called boy burglar in 1828. The folk memory of this case, especially for Irish Catholics in the St. John area, that Bergen had been hanged for stealing a loaf of bread. In reality, he was convicted of committing two burglaries at night, which in the 1820s was a capital offense, right? It was a, it was a hanging offense. But I found it interesting that... Uh, uh, although that was a partly myth, myth, mythologic, mythical uh, story that uh, uh, the defense lawyer brought that out for the jurors. Uh, so well, the jury was briefly, uh, this is T.W. Anglin, editor of the Freeman. Uh, while jury was briefly absent deliberating uh, uh, on the Patrick Slavin Jr. case, constables brought Breen and the elder Slavin back to court for sentencing. Judge Parker sentenced them to be hanged on December 11th, 1857. Slavin stated that he was, quote, satisfied. The prisoners reported as exhibiting a firm demeanor throughout the entire proceedings. The jury then returned to the court. The trial jury then returned to court and announced that Pat Slavin was guilty of murder, but recommended mercy. The judge agreed, and his sentence was backed by a detailed justification as if to underscore the sensitive nature of the case. He cited the defendant's age uh, and his lack of education and the poor example of his father, plus the likelihood that he was in fear of his father. Now, uh, what about religious and ethnic tensions? Again, as I mentioned earlier, despite the intensity of these issues in the 1840s and into the 1850s, and the expansion and growing influence of the Loyal Orange Association, for example, I didn't find much sectarianism on display in court, relatively little in the press, which is surprising. One of the reasons, you know, could be the sources uh, for much of these weeks when the uh, when the trial was on, um, we haven't found uh, surviving uh, copies of the Freeman, right? So some of the Freeman stories are reprinted in other newspapers, but we'd like to have the full run of the Freeman for 1857, particularly the editorials, right? Uh, so the Morning News, the New Brunswick Reporter, and the Courier, uh, rivals of the Freeman, did print crit critical comments on Anglin's newspaper coverage and on, also on the propriety of allowing Catholic women to visit Breen and Slavin, convicted murderers, in jail pending their executions. Who were these women? Well, stay tuned. We'll talk about them in a, in a minute. Uh, so we're now going to talk about the role of the Catholic Church, which I found really fascinating here. Uh, at the time, uh, John Sweeney was pastor of St. Malachy's Roman Catholic Church near the courthouse. He tended to the condemned men. Other priests did as well. And he was actually on the platform when Slavin Sr. was executed. Uh, we don't know much about how Pat Slavin, uh, the, the youth, was treated when he was in jail. Uh, as, but as was expected, Sla uh, Patrick's uh, death sentence was commuted to life in prison. After his sentence, Slavin Sr. Uh, supposedly expressed great remorse for his crimes. He was kind of a tough guy in court, uh, but he expressed great uh, re remorse for his crimes and confessed more gruesome details to the county sheriff. Uh, 
On the night before his execution, the illiterate Slavrin issued a statement, obviously written by someone else because he could not write, uh, thanking the Catholic clergy and, quote, those ladies who consoled me by their advice and religious instruction. The statement claimed that he was penitent. He acknowledges the uh, heinousness of his crimes and the justness of his punishment. So who were the pious ladies who visited the condemned men? Well, it turned out that they were a number of nuns from the Order of the Sisters of Charity, as well as Catholic laywomen. These were middle-class Catholic laywomen who were going in to visit the two condemned uh, murderers. Uh, remember that uh, one of these men had killed an entire family, including four children. Uh, so uh, at the time, the Catholic Diocese of St. John was experiencing institutional growth uh, under uh, Bishop Thomas Connolly, who later went on to uh, Nova Scotia. Connolly recruited uh, nuns from the Order of the Sacred Heart to operate an orphanage following the 1847 cholera epidemic, which killed large numbers of working class people in St. John, including large numbers of Irish Catholic immigrants. Uh, he also brought Sisters of Charity from New York to teach in the city's separate schools and began construction of the new cathedral. It turned out that uh, uh, Sweeney, who we mentioned earlier, was also the vicar general for the diocese, and he would replace Connolly as bishop and continue the program of institutional expansion. So again, the church's involvement with the prisoners during the final stage was highly symbolic of the increasingly active and public role of the denomination, whose leaders appeared to exert some control over the execution. The message here was that even condemned murderers were part of the flock and could not escape the authority of the Church of Rome. And this is a, a uh, this is a Sister Honora Conway uh, from the Sisters of Charity, who I think came here uh, from Nova Scotia. Uh, so now we're going to talk about Breen. Uh, although he had been chained to the floor as a safety precaution in his cell, on the evening of December 6, uh, prior to the executions, Breen was found by the daughter of the jailer hanging in his cell, a silk handkerchief around his neck attached to an improvised wooden brace. The death was ruled a suicide by a coroner's jury. In the press, he was described as a coward. Uh, he had also committed a grave sin against his faith, suicide. Uh, a macabre situation followed when one, up to 1,000 curious people viewed Breen's body in the cell in which he had died. So again, this gets back to the point about uh, the Victorian fascination with death. Uh, maybe these people felt they had been cheated out of the hanging, was, which was going to be a public hanging. These things only happen maybe once in a lifetime. Uh, it was noted that the cell contained several Catholic medallions, some pictures or prints attached to the wall, and a copy of the prayer of St. Patrick. So I, I tried to look up what the prayer of St. Patrick was, and of course there's, there's like lots of different prayers uh, uh, of St. Patrick. So I don't know if that means if Breen could read or he was just having this for reassurance. Slavin's execution uh, attracted a crowd of several thousand spectators, including women, and it was watched over by a police and a detachment of British uh, troops, a 62nd Regiment, which is part with the garrison in St. John. Uh, and pre-Confederation Canada, or the pre-Confederation era, there was no roving uh, Dominion uh, hangman. So the sentence had to be carried out by the county sheriff, uh, Charles Johnson. Uh, the prisoner was silent on the scaffold, probably at the assistance of, his, of the Catholic spiritual advisors, who opposed the individualist traditions of, con of condemned Protestant prisoners who uttered last words. Again, um, not in every case, but some of the cases I've looked at, uh, ca Catholic, um, people, Catholic people about the executed are, are fairly silent uh, on the scaffold, whereas there's a tradition coming out of England, uh, not so much France, where, where uh, condemned murderers are, are given a chance to, you know, uh, say their last words, maybe give a speech warning people not to uh, follow the life of sin and, and that type of thing. Uh, so again, uh, the Catholic Church is right there to the end. So as Reverend Sweeney said a prayer, Sheriff Johnson cut a rope, a hinge trap door opened, and the hooded prisoner dropped to a quick death. Now the, the, uh, the, the uh, scaffold was built on the outside of the jail facing what the loyalist burial ground right and there's reports of people climbing in trees and getting on top of buildings and things like that but the crowd could not see the prisoner actually uh, uh the final moments of the prisoner because that was shrouded uh but they could see him go through the trap door so patrick B breen again because he was a suicide patrick breen was uh catholic, catholic canon law prohibited funerals in the case of a suicide so he was actually buried in the almshouse burial ground. The almshouse was in East St. John at this time. It's the poor house, the county poor house, right? Uh, in Ireland, both Breen and Slavin would have been buried in uh, something uh, in, a, in an unofficial graveyard called a Celine 
uh, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly in, in, in Irish, but C-I-L-L-I-N. Uh, uh, this was an unofficial graveyard where uh, most of the bodies were of unbaptized children. And we've heard in recent years of the discovery of some of these, uh, and it's in kind of a parallel to some of these uh, uh, burial sites we that have been found recently at residential schools or near residential schools in Canada of, uh, of Indigenous children. Uh, there's also a tradition of unbaptized children in Ireland being, being buried in these uh, in these uh, unofficial uh, graveyards, unconsecrated. Slavin was buried in the Catholic cemetery, which I took to mean St. Mary's uh, near, the ref you know, near the refinery, possibly in, this, in the so-called free ground, which is noted on this slide here in the rear of the cemetery, which uh, was reserved for unbaptized children uh, uh, and possibly executed murders. But again, I have to track down that, that, that detail. Uh, so we're getting near the end here. Uh, in December 13th, uh, so this is the, uh, the last thing I'm going to talk about here uh, to wrap this up is just the possibility of the seventh victim, which I'm not going to go to in a lot of detail. It's kind of a bizarre add on to the story. In December, on December 13th, 1857, children skating on the Little River in Simon's Parish discovered human remains. Another coroner's inquest was held. And the coroner's inquest determined that the dead man was St. John resident Henry Stewart, who was married, who had failed to turn up at work in October. He'd been missing for a while. Given the location of the body, and by the way, uh, the head was separated from the torso, so that, that, that brought even more public fascination, right? Uh, uh, the gory or the better. There were rumors that Stewart uh, had a connection with Breen and Slavin, and, and from the penitentiary, young Pat Slavin had now been, uh, having escaped the hangman's noose, was now you know, starting his sentence, his life sentence in the New Brunswick Penitentiary. He confirmed that the robbers had met the dead man at the night of the Mackenzie killing on the road to St. John, uh, and Breen had gone with him for a while. Uh, despite the lack of other evidence, there was really not a lot of cor corroboration, uh, corroborating evidence uh, of Pat's uh, tale. The inquest decided that Stewart had been killed by Breen. Uh, and this, again, it seems highly unlikely, and it appeared to be another attempt by young Pat Slavin to shift more blame uh, onto, uh, on, uh, away from his father, uh, as if you know his father admitted to killing six people, but to shift more blame uh, away from his father onto his father's accomplice, Hugh Breen. So just a couple of postscripts on this. Uh, I think, oh, that's the last slide. Uh, in 1871, Pat Slavin escaped from the New Brunswick Penitentiary. Again, I often joke, uh, I, I talk about penitentiaries in the, uh, some of my uh, my history of uh, legal history classes, the 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 the, the uh, New Brunswick Penitentiary. This is before they built Dorchester. Uh, the security was not uh, that great. There's one case where someone broke into the penitentiary and stole things, right? So if you can break into a penitentiary and and, rot, and, and be a burglar, be a burglar in a penitentiary, maybe you have to check your security setup. Anyway, in 1871, Pat escaped from the pen. He made it to Maine, and although he was arrested and detained, uh, there was no extradition. Uh, for his class of offender, he could not be extradited back to uh, uh, to new, back to Canada. So he remained in Maine, uh, got a job, was a laborer, and never returned to New Brunswick. So it's someone else I'd like to try to track down to see whatever happened to him. Final thing, two final things. In 1895, William Kilby Reynolds published uh, Old Time Tragedies, which is shown here uh, in, the in the first page of, of chapter one, uh, and uh, it was. Uh, uh, celebrated cases before the courts of, of from courts in St. John, New Brunswick. It's a short book based on a series of newspaper articles he wrote for the St. John Progress, one of the newspapers at the time. One of the cases, the leading, the lead story was the so-called Mispec tragedy, right? So it does provide some new details, some other details uh, to the crime because he, he claims to have interviewed people who remembered uh, the events of the 1850s, right? So again, if you want more detail here, you can also find old time tragedies online, right? If you search for it. Uh, so the final thing, just to wrap this up uh, as an epidemic, academic, uh, the two things, you know, the, the, the details of the, there's a few new details uh, we can flesh out here, but uh, the, the basic uh, uh, story has been told before. It's also been told in the uh, classic uh, true crime book, uh, Six for the Hangman, right? Uh, written by, uh, B.J. Grant in the in in the early, in the 1980s, and many people have a copy of that kicking around. But what, as an academic, uh, what what intrigued me about revisiting the case is what I found in terms of the role of the Catholic Church, uh, post conviction, pre execution, and also what I did not find. What I did not find was that level of 
religious and ethnic antagonism that uh, shaped so much of the decade of the 1840s. And I know from other research on, on policing in St. John that there was still that kind of ethnic religious thing going on in, 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 in day to day policing and run of the mill justice, you know, where the police force was largely Protestant and uh, uh, Irish Catholics were overrepresented in the uh, in, in the arrest records and, and you know in jail sentences and things like that. So again, those are the two takeaways as uh, as an academic. I'm going to now stop the uh, the presentation. I'm just going to stop the recording.